Hi there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this installation of Artists in Conversation. My name is Jasmine Johnson. I'm the Artistic Production Associate here at Manhattan Theatre Club, and we are just so, so thrilled to have these two brilliant, amazing creatives with us. We are so happy to have Kim Matt Martin and Monza Ra. Um, so I'll just dive into just a couple quick things before I let Kim Matt and Manzara take it away. Um, so we will be doing a Q&A at the end. So wherever you're tuning in from, whether that's Facebook or YouTube, feel free to drop any questions that you may have during the conversation into the chat and I will be taking note of all of them. And at the end, I'll pop back on and facilitate a, a short little Q&A. Um, the only other thing that I wanna say is I just wanna acknowledge we are living in a time where we're dependent on technology. So if at any moment someone's Wi-Fi freezes or anything like that, we'll just take a breath and jump back into it when the technology stars say we can. Uh, and with that, I will pass it off to Kim Matt and Manzara. Thanks, Jess. Yeah, man. What's up, friend? Hey, how's it going? Great. I'm I'm so excited. Seriously, this is really exciting. And also we have so many things that we already planned and can talk about. And these lovely white folks gave us an hour on their platform. So we <laughs> add that, why not? <laughs> I say I say so. I feel like we have like an hour's worth of things to talk about. If as we introduce ourselves and our relationship over the the many years we've known each other. Yeah. 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 I'm looking at my notes now. It's like sheesh. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, let, I mean, we, this is what we decided to do. Maybe we should tell people what we talked about, which is that we have had an interesting journey, and we wanted to maybe do it as like a timeline, essentially, right? And so we met in 2013? Question mark. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and we should tell people the circumstances that are how we met, which I think is hilarious, and also led to this other beautiful thing. I don't know. I, I what was you it? Tell what, it. <laughs> you, so, okay, here's the thing. So uh, a friend of mine, I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas originally, or Mansa, I'm your, this is your introduction of your new name. Take your time, take your time. Mansa, I used to be Jure, everybody, um, oh. and I recently changed my name and I'm not biting anyone's head off for, for <laughs> taking their time to transition. I'm transitioning. Yeah, but I'll tell it quickly how we met. You're uh, a partner of yours at the time, who was a childhood friend of mine, uh, was th that partner of yours is going to be in a play that I was doing. And he was like, oh, I'm dating this dude who uh, is just gotten, you I think at that point you had just gotten in a yell? Were you in your uh, Yeah, I had just gotten in, yeah. Yeah, and so then I cast him in this play and I was like, oh, he's coming, he's a playwright from Yale. I was like, he wanna, does he wanna like do a pre-show talk at our <laughs> event? And remember we had that conversation where I was like, yo, I, I don't even know you, but you want to just come since you're coming to see the play. And I told you then that I love talkbacks. Like this is one of my favorite <laughs> things to do that um, that I got my start at the Alliance Theater in Atlanta. And I was a dramaturg there and they let me do some workshops of my plays there. But my favorite thing I got to do is like after shows, host discussions. Yeah. And so when I got the opportunity to do it for Fences and then when I found out it was the very first time August Wilson had been done in the state of Iowa. I was like, oh, I want to be there for this historic fences. Yeah. And then I don't, you know, all right. Like I, my boyfriend then, was like, oh, like where I'm going to, I'm going to be in a play in Arkansas. I'm there. Totally. Let yeah. me host it. And it turned out to be my favorite production of fences I've ever seen. Like it was one of them. It, it like verified that when you do theater for community and in a community, that's where the magic is. That, mm -hmm. um, that, that it was so clear that this was the first time this audience had experienced this story. And I had just seen offenses at Long Wharf that season. I literally had just seen one. And it was this kind of like, you know, like sterile, respectable kind of situation where it's like, we're gonna really dig into, you know, the 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 nuances of how August Wilson lose, uses language. And then your production, literally like Troy is like flipping Corey over his back and like slamming into the ground. And it was like, I've never seen fences so like violent, but also so real. You know, I mean, so a few things. One is that to your point about it never being seen, this is obviously before the film had been shot or released because this was 20 because the film was i don't know what year the film was but this is 2014 when we did this production so it was before the film so truly people were like experiencing this text in this this city of des moines for the first time and on top of that 
uh, in terms of the the violence and the way that I embraced it, I, I'm just listen. It's if people read, it's in the te- it's in the play. Like Troy, literally <laughs> have a whole monologue where he talks about his father beating him so bad that his eyes are black blue to the point that he couldn't see. You know that horrific monologue where he tells that story. And so I'm like, oh well, this is because for me it was about like the intersections of like generational curses and trauma and like all this other stuff. So anyway, so that's how it manifested. It. Shout out to Freddie Fulton, brilliant. New York based actor who's a dear friend of ours and a co-founder of the theater that we started who played Corey in that production and got beat up every night and crawled out of the <laughs> yard down the Oh, head. and then when Cor- and when Troy comes back with the baby, everybody gasped. And I was like, it was it was just the most visceral experience I had in a theater. And and y'all and you basically put that together. Like yeah. that was that was, was a thing that you well, yes, but it was the start of what ended up being our friendship and partnership uh, in starting Pyramid, which basically happened almost a year later, essentially. Because then the very next year, so, okay, so there's a few stories here that are hilarious. Because we had we met that way, me and you hit it off. And at the time, I was still making my transition from actor to director. So I was like, ooh, I want to visit Yale. Because I had never at that point been to New Haven. And do you remember when I came up and I stayed with you and now Tony nominee, Shalia? Yeah, <laughs> your yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> your roommate at the time. And I slept on the air mattress in your living room and visited New Haven and Yale for the first time. And we had a really crazy weekend that sometimes I forget how now it feels hilarious to say because I was sleeping in you and Shalia's apartment. And at the time you were rehearsing 5013 that Jonathan- Oh snap, Jonathan Majors was directing that. Now everywhere Jonathan Majors was directing your play. And I like came and sat in a rehearsal with y'all and all of that. And we also did were a- you, Were you applying to schools at that point as well, that while you were visiting? Yes, I was applying to grad schools at that point, but I hadn't made up my mind. Of, I was I wanted to visit Yale because I knew you, and so I was like, oh, okay, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll visit Yale. And then, yeah, and then do you also remember that we did, there was a, uh, this was right in the middle of, I was living in St. Louis, and Ferguson was happening. And so oh. there, uh, do you remember there was a protest when I came to visit you? And oh yeah, yeah. And I ended yeah, up. We, did, we all did the um, the Diane. With it was yeah. me, Tori, and I ended up doing the Diane, and I was holding hands. Do you remember that with Tanya Pinkins? It was. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was all that same weekend. Yeah, every, uh, oh, no. I just want to like paint the full picture of that of that Diane. It was one of it was just an early kind of demonstration. Uh, where we line, we all students involved from the law school, the Yale Law School, to the courthouse, and we lined our bodies and we laid there for four minutes and it was a while. Yeah, we all down, and I was like lay down the street, sandwiched between like Tori Sampson, great writer, friend of ours, and Tanya Pinkins and you. And I, at that point, was still mainly just making theater in Des Moines, so it was hilarious to me that like this was my life all of a sudden. All like, of a sudden, and then it never stopped being your life. It was just kind of like now, now you have tons of famous friends, and you're doing amazing things with all of your famous friends. Um, you're one to talk, but yeah, sure, we both are. I did, I mean, but this is what's interesting. This helps transition to what we said, which is like the timeline. So, like, you saw that production of Fences and got involved. I met you and Tori, and when I came up, well, I met Tori when I came to visit. And then I convinced you both to come to Des Moines the next summer. I'm curious to hear your remembrance of how that went down. Oh man, this is so, first of all, it's funny to do a timeline of this because our conversations, cause we're on the phone all the time and like are all over the place. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, I would like stick to the, to the roadmap. So <laughs> yeah, so, so basically I had the time of my life in Des Moines. I just like thought everybody was such a good time. I thought everyone was really talented and I thought the community was really warm and inviting in a, in a way that I just had never felt before. And so it did not take much convincing on my part when you said we're doing a soldier's play, do you want a dramaturg? And I'm like, favorite activity. And I'm like, hey, Tori, um, let's, you want to go to summer camp? <laughs> and it was really like artists in residence for that summer working on our own pieces. One of those pieces was Too Heavy for Your Pocket, actually. Um, and and then Cadillac Crew also, um, which, yeah. uh, which Leah did at Yale Rep. Yeah. I mean, it's so wild to see like the seeds oh. that are planted. 
Yeah, we You're did. Growing. I apologize to Tori all the time for, for years. So I'm going to do it again publicly. We did a not good reading of Cadillac Crew. I produced a terrible reading and she was not happy with it. And that is okay. But I learned a lot of great lessons as a young producer <laughs> on that project. And even more importantly, we had a great summer. And you and Tori taught that class too to local aspiring yeah. poets as well. Yeah. It's true. It's true. But I think that that's what's so interesting. So, so the founding of Pyramid, what's so interesting is that when there is a gap in the, when a community has a need, it's hard to resist trying to fill all of that need, right? The teach the classes and have an artist in residence and do a new play and do a classic and the mission, all of that. And really like, you know, wanting to do all of it and, and really feeling like all of it can be done and should be done. But like, but that, that was one of the, the growing pains is like how to keep all these balls in the air and make feel, people feel good and respected and happy to be volunteering their time because everybody's doing work for free. Basically, yeah. I mean, and then it led to, like you said, the founding of, of Pyramid, of, our, of the theater company that we, and along with, uh, I can't do math. Five of our friends, you know, got to found. I, I want to name them all: Tiffany Johnson, Claudine Cheatham, Freddie Fulton, Nana Coleman, Alexis Davis. The seven of us all together. We're like, yeah, let's just start a theater, a black theater in Iowa, of all places. And I think you were the only one who really knew how much work that would take. <laughs> like, just to be honest, because Kim at least likes to leave us in the dark. He likes to tell us our, our the our the best part of what we might be doing. So he might tell Alexis, "Oh, you're just dealing with the money. It's all that's all you're doing." Versus, and here's your team, and somebody's gonna be late. You want to call them? <laughs> it's like, and and I think just to be like put it out there is like this amazing idea of like, of course we'll incorporate. We're doing shows anyway. We're making money. There's a profit. All that stuff. And then Nana is like sitting here with the tax documents, trying to like get us like really like situated and I don't know what he's talking about even though I'm the artistic director and it was this like adventure ragtag adventure that I think that you did have the most wherewithal on is that true I think I'm asking you publicly because I'm too afraid to ask in private <laughs> <laughs> I think that's true and it's funny because I think this leads into the a larger piece of this conversation that we've obviously you know said we wanted to have which is that I, yes, I think I knew what it took because for me, having grown up in Little Rock uh, at basically like literally grew up at the Arkansas Rep under uh, Bob Hupp, who's now artistic director at Syracuse stage. Like when I was 15, like Bob literally just kind of took me under his wing and was like, yo, you want to like come hang out at rehearsal with me? And I'd be like, yeah. He's like, you got to come to this like marketing meeting too. And I'm like, what, what does that mean? You know, so like my brain kind of always situated around like, oh, okay, you are an artist, but like there's like logistics and things you have to like figure out to make the art. And I think I just kind of naturally always embrace that. But what I also knew to be true is that you need really smart, great, flexible, innovative artists, obviously, to help balance that out. And you also need people who can do like the Nana, you know, Nana's an actuary, you know, like that's the other beautiful nuance thing about our theater. And I think speaks to its longevity as it now just this summer was its seventh summer in existence, you know, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, which is exciting, but it was because we brought people to the table who were non theater people to handle the logistical side who were just like, all right, I'm, he's, he's, he will handle the taxi. You know what I mean? So but it was it was tricky and it led to a really hard first season, which is like the thing. So our first season of Pyramid, you had the brilliant idea. And I want to give you credit for this because I've yet to see I it, I'm sure it has existed elsewhere, but I've yet to quite see the production that I think spoke to it in the way that we were talking about it. But we did a raisin in the sun, and then we did this great new play that you directed, uh, called Hooded or Being Black for Dummies by our, our dear friend Terrence Chisholm. Shout out to Terrence. And, but you had the idea and really kickstarted Tiffany Johnson, who's now the artistic director of Pyramid and like doing her great work. You gave her her directorial debut. You were like, no, Tiffany should direct A Raisin in the Sun. And it was like, yeah, of course she should. And, but she then came in and made the decision, especially as like a first time director who didn't come from the same kind of like, background and experience that you and I had come from of being in the quote unquote professional theater and around it, like at Alliance and all these other places and whatnot. And she was yeah. like, oh no, I, I'm gonna direct it and it's just about these three women. Like to her, the play was about these three women and she completely decentralized 
uh, Walter Lee in a way that I thought was really smart. And you really helped shepherd that. Um, and then we did Hooded and it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> but new plays are always hard, right? Like that's part of the mission of Pyramid is like a development place and not a world premiere place that, you know, we we both kind of know what development hell looks like and fighting over world premiere rights and all yeah. the bureaucracy I think that happens in these larger, um, you know, institutions that we really just got to get in the thick of it. Um, and, and, and I think what... Uh, Sorry, I'm just gonna like reference Brandy and Monica versus like just a little bit like, you know, yes, there was a falling out. You and I had a falling out. It was a oh, very yeah. intense falling out. We did not yeah. talk for years and we talk now. Like, and, and so it was a hard first season, but I, but I think what is true about it is it's because like community building is hard, right? Like, like community building, I think does take um, conversations that are difficult where both parties feel very strongly in opposite direction and like, and they don't have, a, they, they need some time to cool off, right? right. Um, or they need some time to follow a direction and not another direction, that kind of um, sensation. Uh, it, it's for me, it's like the fact that Hooded still happened, <laughs> the fact that a raisin and the sun was this beautiful, like, you know, womanist um, production. And then I kind of went on about my day, you know, and I, and I like went back to Connecticut and like really concentrated on getting the Yale degree because they were trying to kill me. For me is like, yeah, that's a little bit like how I am with my own family, right? How I am even like going back to Nashville. Like there are hard conversations. I go off a little bit and I come back. It's like even like a me thing and how I relate to community and family more so I think than, um, you know, than other things. Yeah, no, it's so interesting. And I wanna, cause we talked about this so we, we prepped it, right? That I wanna talk about the falling out and the journey to coming back together, but also like all the things that were swirling around it. Because I think one of the key things that we said we wanted to talk about, so you went to Yale and got your MFA in playwriting, because I'm realizing, you know, people don't know us. So I'm gonna like say some of the facts of it, right? So it's like, yeah. we met, we found at a theater. You were currently at Yale. At the time, by the time we did a soldier's play, shortly thereafter and before we got to doing, when we were doing Raising the Hood, it was when I was at the Goodman, the first time doing my fellowship there and my apprenticeship rather. And that was such a rough, what was so crazy is I don't think either of us knew how rough either of those experiences were for on either side. And so what led to the falling out, I think was actually the, the result of you navigating what was your situation at Yale, and I won't speak for you, but I know that was a complex situation, right? It's and then, traumatizing, yeah. Traumatizing. <laughs> I don't want to use that word and use it, but like, you know, yeah. that was the situation. And then on the flip side of that, for me, I had, we had just found and started this theater. I had, if you recall the year before, tried to get into grad school and didn't. And I was in this place of, I quit my day job. I took this gig at the Goodman and moved to Chicago, which like caused me to take like a ten thousand dollar pay cut from what was my day job. Because thankfully, that apprenticeship was like had a salary and like benefits and stuff. But I moved to Chicago and it was like rough. And you and Freddie, who were like two of my closest friends and partners in founding this thing, Freddie then was in his first year at Columbia. You're in your last year at Yale, and I'm in my first year of this apprenticeship, roughing it in Chicago like living in a not so great place. If my mother is watching- And flying back and forth, right? And, and still going back to- right. uh, At that point, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like literally making, like any free weekend I had where I didn't have like an event at Goodman, I was in Des Moines. And like every waking second that I had free, cause we were starting a theater and it was all new, you know? And so like I had that stress and what I didn't and couldn't ever wrap my head around at that point but now that I've been in grad school and had my own trauma from when I was at Brown getting my MFA, I, I could never have grasped what you were going through, obviously, at Yale in the same way that you couldn't have grasped like what I was dealing with, you know, down there. And I think that is really the thing that those those uh, different individual traumas, right, <laughs> led to is what drove the wedge between us and created the schism, if you will, as you called it uh, the other day. Uh, that led to our, our falling out and not speaking to each other for years, which absolutely 
is a function of like the white supremacist fucked up structures and systems. Oh, first F bomb. I did good so far. But like, <laughs> hey, shit, here we, we here now. Like, we're going to talk about it. like navigating these institutions as Black Southern men that, you know, are finding our ways into these places that we have found them is hard. And the traumas that we were experiencing individually is what led to the the wedge that came between us. And it just makes me always think about who else has fallen victim to that and not had the beautiful moment that we had of reconciliation. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when you, so you said you were an apprentice at the Goodman mm -hmm. while driving to keep the pyramid, the company that we founded afloat. And you were doing that level of hustling the year before you got into Brown. Is that, is that the timeline? Correct. The same at the same time as applying to grad school. So by the time the spring hit, when I had been like admitted and knew I was headed to Brown that fall, I was still like working full time with the Goodman, running back and forth. Then by the summer, I you know I was like preparing to move like to Rhode Island, right? And like for you, yeah. you had just finished it, Yale, and you I think was too heavy, kind of sort of on its journey at that point, yeah. Yeah, so 2016 is when I won the Candida um, Alliance graduate playwriting competition with Too Heavy. But mm -hmm. I, but I, all right, two things I want to just point out, I think, just in case like any of my students are on. Um, mm -hmm. th so you were going back and forth before you apply, the year that you applied to school and then moved across the country to get to Brown. Yep. And like, the intensity of that kind of like incubation period for me, I was working three jobs and had um, an, in, uh, a fellowship with the Alliance Theater. Um, we can also point out at how like, you know, these positions are like, why are you working this many jobs? And you're like, you know, you have a position and you're one of the only people of color. Like if I were to take my current lenses and look back, but yep. really like it is true the amount of sacrifice and hustle that it takes to like to be in a position to chase your dreams yeah. right like yeah. all of that really does require so often at least and for our case a lot of you know <laughs> balls in the air and then to get to yale um i think complicated is the, is a better word actually that it wasn't all traumatic that i as i'm thinking like i remember when i got the interview I flew up, it was March, and I was shook that there was still snow on the ground. Like, I'm like, I don't, <laughs> I don't get this. Um, and then I had coffee with Sarah Rule, who is like one of my, like, who is my teacher. Yeah. Um, and she, she, she said that she loved the poetry of my piece. Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking to myself, if I never get to see New Haven, Connecticut again, because this was a foreign place at the time, like, this would have been worth it. Like, this would have been worth it. Wow. And to and then the very first weekend, like the very first show there, me and Shalia Latour, Tony nominee, yes. <laughs> it, uh, did a did a poetry piece together for the school. Like mm -hmm. I like like just kind of like uh, the the two of us in the cabaret, and it was a space where like magic happened. But it was also the space where I had a teacher hand me back my script with the cuts pre made on it. Um, letting me know that, that, and this is in the middle of rehearsal, in the middle of rehearsal, here are the cuts you're going to make. Um, and to, to know that this was a white woman cutting Black characters' language for her clarity um, and, and, and demanding it. Um, it was a really difficult place to be where it's like, okay, why am I here? Am I here to make friends and collaborators? Am I here to get this degree? Am I here to learn how to navigate uh you know the white american theater system and then on top of that and it's a lot of work working on a theater pyramid theater company was like requiring a lot um as far as programming the season as far as making calls to donors as far as be keeping up with the board and as far as paperwork for the government that all of those balls were so much to juggle that I'm like, you know, I am sure I had a meltdown. Like I am sure that part of what occurred was, it was like a, like a real sense of um, when I get, when I get right, I'll be able to come back. And I think that that's true actually what has yeah. happened. 
Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting because I think I definitely had many a meltdown. And I, the other thing we should say about Pyramid, because I don't want people at home to get it twisted. Like we started Pyramid with zero capital. Like, <laughs> I, you know, none of us come from money. We didn't have any parents. Oh. To, like write a check. Like it was like, when I say like, we literally started at dollar zero. Now, granted, we had goodwill in the community because yep. fences and a soldier's play had already happened. And we had built up a kind of following and donor list. So we, we, that's what it's like. We had a mailing list. It's yeah, like, we have that. <laughs> we had and so people who saw a couple of plays we did, they were like, oh, that was cute. The little black kids did some plays. And so we figured out a way, basically. But from but from zero, in, in, including where are we going to do this play, right? OK, yeah. what theater can we afford? Oh, what theater has space for us? I mean, yeah. the, the logistics were, were just tremendous in a way that um, that I appreciate now, but 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 at the time for sure is kind of like the labor of love the seven of us were having to give to us and most of us doing it remotely. Yeah. It's like, um, I, I don't know, for, for Pyramid to still be going strong is like, y'all are bosses, bosses. <laughs> no, it, yeah, shout out to Tiffany Johnson and Alexis Davis again for keeping Pyramid afloat. But, and this also intersects those, Monsa, with our the respective ladder climbing that you and I were both trying to do at the same time, well, that all of us were trying to do, but particularly for you and I, like within the business, like we are very, like we had goals, you know, like I mean, we used to talk about like the dreams of like, you know, the things that we wanted to do. So it was all like happening and intersecting while, so then like you finally graduated Yale and by the time- oh my God. <laughs> and then I went into my first year at Brown to get my MFA in directing. And I will just call it traumatizing, like straight up. They know how I feel about it. Mm. I, had a, I actually taught a class there this morning. So it's like all good. But like, you know, it was not, mm -mm, they weren't ready. I was literally, I was, in my case, the specifics of it and the nuances, I was only the second black man to ever come through that directing program. So yeah, yeah. So like by the time I got there, and it was also like a really charged time in like Trinity Rep's world and history. So like I walked into, unbeknownst to me, like a firestorm of just like mm. madness and then was still running Pyramid. Cause even though you had at that point gone away and this is when we're in our period of not speaking to one another too, but like I was still but like- I don't know any of them. Yes, yeah, so like flying back and forth. So like now, the goal is like, we have to raise enough money. So Pyramid's budget was growing, which was nice because the content was good. The first season was a smash. Like your production of Hooded was like a hit that people still talk about in Moines to this day. The Raisin in the Sun was a hit block. So like it became a little bit easier to raise the money, but now we're raising money for like literally a housing and travel line just to afford to bring me back and forth to run the darn thing, you know? Like it was, it was wild. And then, so then it was crazy because you and I are not, <laughs> talking and yet I don't know what it was like for you during that period because we both just like were busy and living our lives but there were always like the little moments or blips where it like you would come up or like or we would like intersect here and there but we never actually connected and so it was like for me it was in, it was exciting like when too heavy happened like I was so 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 excited and I don't even I've never told you this story I uh I snuck into the city before too heavy closed and I and I and I got a ticket and I went and I sat in the back of the house. But because we weren't speaking at the time, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm oh. gonna make a out of it. But I was so of proud the, of the roundabout production. That's the that's where you snuck into. Yeah. Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> I didn't know that. Well, because it was special because I found out that you had you you, you gave Pyramid props in the playbill in your bio. Of course, I dedicated the production to Pyramid. I know. <laughs> Like for me, it was crazy because like here I am running this thing that we built and it was like cool as hell to be able to say like, yo, we just had an off Broadway play that was dedicated to us while I'm still like navigating the grad school of it all and all the trauma that was my time. And to be clear, all the trauma at, at, during my time at Brown was not just because of the program. Like there was just a lot going on. Like I had a classmate pass away. I think I've told you some of it. Like there was a lot mm -hmm. happening uh, there. But um. Anyway, all this to say, it's like, there was always this moment where I always knew deep down that we would find our way back. <laughs> like, to each other. Yeah, yeah. You know? Can you tell the story of us finding our way back? Yes. I know we're skipping around, but I just wanna, I like it's when you right. tell it. It's a really beautiful story though, because it also shows, yeah. So I, six, 
months before I graduated. You know this part of this. I guess you don't really know this either. So when I got my job, I'm the former producing director of Williamstown Theater Festival. I was I was the producing director there. And sure just, drop that casually, okay. Well, I could <laughs> context for like how we reconnected. So Is, are you gonna squeeze your Tony in? nomination into this conversation I, I or are you gonna there are two plays that yes i am responsible for i produced and and negotiated their broadway transfers that got 20 nominations yesterday that is a fact while you were casually yeah uh, gotcha gotcha i'm just you're just being casual stop it <laughs> really stop but no like here's the thing though so i don't know if i've ever told you this story when i got that job at williamstown i was in the middle of doing my thesis at brown and brown let me leave six months early so I closed my thesis on December 9th. I watched half of my closing matinee. I moved to New York City that same night and then started my job on December 10th the next day at Williamstown as the producing director. <laughs> technically still a student. I've never talked about this publicly where I was like still like writing papers and like trying to pop into classes and seminars while also negotiating contracts and deals and, and producing, like actively producing the plays at Williamstown. Um, but one of the things that me and my former uh, colleague and uh, then the artistic director there, uh, she uh, took me as her date to opening night of Choir Boy on Broadway. And so I was excited because that by was- By the esteemed Terrell album McCranny. Yeah, by the esteemed, uh, esteemed Terrell album McCranny. But um, so that was my very first Broadway opening. I had never, at that point, I had never been to an opening of a Broadway show. And it was really exciting for me. And so I went and I was with her and we get into the lobby. What was this at the Friedman, right? Like, is that what the theater was, right? Yeah. And as soon as I walk in the door, like we see Terrell and like some other, like Andre Holland. And so we're like, you know, speaking and saying hello and all of that. And then I walk in the theater and the very first person I see when I walk in the theater is you. And we haven't, at this point we had not talked or said like a word to each other and communicated at all in- Haven't talked, haven't seen each other, nothing. <laughs> three-ish and a half years, I guess, at that point, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And you just, we just gave each other this big old hug. And, and it was the, and it was the perfect night for it, I think. I think yeah. that it was, it, what's so amazing about Choir Boy, just as a show, is that that show has been deserving to be on Broadway, right? Like Choir, I mean, Terrell Alvin McCraney has been an inspiration. He's part of why I wrote my first play. Um, and for, him to be receiving his flowers. Hillary and Bill Clinton were there. Um, it was like this stunning celebration of this Oscar winner who I like happen to be buddies with. And then there's like the guy that I started Pyramid with, who like is like, who before I even like knew that this was the path I was like committed to, I like have been in the trenches. I've slept on your couch. We have like gotten shit faced together. Like it's <laughs> like, and now here we are on Broadway. <laughs> it was so open. amazing to be in that room. <laughs> no, truly, I mean, it was insane. And also, you know, in that room, like it was like everybody was there. You know, it's it, truly, it was like all of like Black Broadway and so many folks were there and it also was like, cause you didn't know what I was doing. Like you didn't know why I was in the city. No like, clue. you know, so, yeah. I, so I introduced- I was going to like, oh, there's Kim <laughs> <laughs> I like introduced you to my former boss and I'm like, I'm I'm the producer at Williamstown now. Like, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was wild. It was wild. And then there was also still then like a moment though, where like we hung out a little bit that night at the opening night party. And then we like slowly started finding our way back you know, into what is now like our, our friendship again, and also our, you know, hopefully artistic partnerships for the future, things we're talking about, obviously, but like, you know, it, it was so, beautiful. So sh shout, shout out to MTC and Terrell for hosting our reunion. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was funny. And then it's also like, you know, to your point about the fact that that play deserved, you know, to be on Broadway, I think so much sooner than it did. Cause it was also like finding me at a point, I mean, cause now we can skip forward to like the present, I think like we, we got through the whole like journey. Cause we are both at two very different places now in terms, I think of like where we are thinking about like our art making in the future, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, oh, I, that was the second. You were writing Finian? on a TV show. 
Oh, you were writing for TV. Yeah, it's true. It's so so. It's interesting. Is like the the transition from from Yale to like a professional career was similarly like very quick for me. A because I was ready to get the hell out of New Haven. It was like I I like almost didn't finish that program because me and the chair were at such odds and it was just like is it even worth it especially after i won the candida uh prize and like knew i had a professional production i was like do i need this but i was like whatever um and we graduated on a sunday and then on monday i flew to atlanta to do the season taste of the season at the alliance um it was just immediate um, and I had gotten a job at Emory. I knew I was going back to Atlanta. Going to New York was something I was uninterested in at the time. I was like, uh, I got this degree. Let me go back home and just like regroup and really appreciate doing too heavy for your pocket in the South for an audience that it was intended in. Because um, cause I had had a, um, a pretty disappointing reading of Too Heavy for Your Pocket at the roundabout, actually, uh, where they passed on the piece. They said they weren't going to do it. Um, and so I'm kind of like, you know what? All right, I get to do it at the Alliance. It's really great. Eventually, I'll make it to New York. Um, and then obviously a roundabout came crawling back, JK. Um, but then decided that they did want to do the play. <laughs> um, and um, and as soon as that was over, I got a job writing for television for New Amsterdam on NBC, um, which was like uh, another situation where I interviewed for the job and they were like, okay, cool, can you start in two months? And I was like, oh, I don't live in Los Angeles. And they were like, yeah, yeah, you want a thousand dollars to move? I don't know. Like we start, the room starts June 1. It was just so, it was just so like, you want this job or not? Um, and I did want the job. Um, and so it, it, was, it was really cool to, and they don't know this actually, I think I called in sick to fly to New York to go to Choir Boy because there was no way in hell I was missing opening night. Um, and so I was actually there for just like a red eye back and forth um, just because I needed to be in that room. Oh yeah. man, there was like memory lane. I know. But, but like, as you're saying, sorry, the segue was something totally different about how we are approaching our art now, right? Like, which, which is interesting because like, the climbing, right? The like, I, I want to, you know, have a regional production and a New York transfer and then a Broadway transfer and then a Western transfer. And then I'll be published and go down in history when the Pulitzer, right? Like that kind of like trajectory for um, a playwright or maybe for yourself, you're, you have, you're a hyphenate. So you're an actor, you're a director, you're a producer. So, so many ladders you're climbing. You keep sneaking actors Are, in there. Like that's still a thing. It is not. If, Guys, go to pyramidtheater.com and you will see pictures <laughs> of Kim Matt Martin dressed as Blair Underwood in a soldier's play. And <laughs> you will know that he's an actor um, and a damn good one. Um, but those, those ladders, right? Those ladders that I think that are um, so often put in front of us because there's shiny awards attached to accomplishment. Um, like we did we climbed you know we did the climbing we got our we got our ivy league degrees you know we did you know we did the striving um to use some yeah. buddhist terms and then to come into this place of 2020 to come into this place of leaving the east coast right because the east yeah. bank and Ache, um and uh, a community where the culture is that ladder and yeah. I think the minute you get outside of the East Coast, you can really see other kinds of ways to maneuver. Um, and both of us have left since. Um, and, and then this kind of radical racial uh, reimagining where, where we don't have to be the tokens anymore. We don't have to be, um, or we don't have to accept tokenism. And for me, that just has given me an opportunity to go back to my roots, which is crashing on your couch and making some cool art for a community that I know is gonna gasp when, like, when the show happens. Yeah, yeah. And, and I can have a conversation with John Busby and that conversation with the press be one of like sheer celebration and yeah. not me defending why anything is, you know, my, my choices as a, you know, yeah. I don't know. I, I, for me, I feel like this, it feels more of a return to what's important as an artist. 
Um, and that is not necessarily the award, so they're nice. It's not necessarily white validation, though it certainly feels good, but actually it's like, did grandma get to see this piece? You know, yeah. did the pastor talk about it? Oh, do you yeah. remember when we went to church together? And I like yeah. wrote a whole scene of Too Heavy for Your Pocket in Our church. Program. I still have that church program. I then I was it. writing it? Yeah. <laughs> you left it in my house and I was like, I knew deep, I, I just felt, I mean, this is, you know, you were literally writing the play. You know, so I was like, the play will end up in New York one day. I will always be able to say, it's literally probably so, if I look for it hard enough, it's like, uh, yeah, I'm on my bookshelf over here. But yeah, I, I still have- it's Archive that, it's gonna be worth billions one day. <laughs> like, origi original scribblings from Too Heavy for Your Pocket. <laughs> But like, here's the thing though, I want to talk about this in the transition to like the moment that we're in now, because I think the other thing about you and I, we talk about like the tokenization piece. I think we both have experienced that in our own way over time and in various different places and spaces, but we also have always been very vocal, outspoken people being like, but we're not here for the white people's like bullshit either. So it's like, uh, there's a dichotomy of sorts. And I love that, you know, all right, we're getting to the portion. I hope it doesn't sound shady, but it's just the truth. Where it's like, okay. for all of the movement working and acting and and, and and activism that's happening right now, you know, there's a lot of people who are like hypercritical of like, why is blah, blah, blah doing blah, blah, blah now when they were blah. And it's like, I speaking specifically like you and I, it's like, no, our roots are like, we started a black theater <laughs> and literally one of the whitest states yeah. in the country because there are black people there who deserve to see themselves represented and who deserve to, to have the, uh, an opportunity to have their stories told and to be the ones responsible for telling those stories. And I think that was, I'll speak for myself, one of the reasons why, and now I'm really talking out of school and it is what it is, I have still even struggled between the last job where I happened to be at Williamstown the first to, to our knowledge and no one has been able to, to disprove it otherwise. And I worked there so I would know, but I was the first full-time staff member of color in their 65 year history when I was hired here. And- How many do they have now? Say that again? When you left, what, did it go back to zero? No, there's somebody- I think there. it went back to one, uh, who was another human that may or may not now work at the institution that we are uh, currently talking on. Get it together, Williamstown, get it together. It was only the second, but like my point is, Citing that was like to go from having started a black ass theater company in, in a space that was specifically for black people. It just happened to be in a white, yeah. predominantly white state, but for black people, right? Um, to go from that and then to be in grad school, like I'll never forget like one of my first conversations with the head of my program and why we always put a head. So like, I had to tell him, I was like, listen, I don't make work as an artist for white people. Like I just don't, I don't mm -hmm. care what white people think of the art that I make. That's not why I make art. It's also why, because I happen to have this other skill set, I'm fine because like capitalism is a thing and like somebody got to pay some bills and like I need health insurance being in these like producerial administrative positions within these institutions yeah. because I understand theater. And so it's like, all right, cool. But like, that's why I'm very particular and picky about like where I'll even engage in art making because when I was in grad school for directing, the other thing that I was saying was that there were so few opportunities to work on new plays in particular as a director, which is where I really live and breathe. Um, because a lot of the black ass plays that I was seeing out there were being directed and helmed by white folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> and I think now you and I are both at an interesting point where we're both like, all right, so I left the gig at Williamstown and then I came back to, okay. Uh, and then I came back to down here and now I'm the associate producer at the Goodman or whatever. But I think we both are like at this point, like as we look towards the future, like what is the kind of art that we really want to make and what are the spaces we want to be in, you know? Yeah. And how to incorporate that into our position on the ladder right now. Like, like for, for example, um, I have a show coming up, whenever uh, we're allowed to do shows. <laughs> and, um, and previously there was a white woman a director attached. Um, and we had to have the hard conversation of, is that actually my preference? No, that's actually not my preference. I communicate that very early on. Now they're willing to listen. And now we are looking for, uh, have found a black woman to direct the piece. That initially that was the intention. And like, how to take the ownership that we move through the world with, like, because we know how to run our own companies and start them from scratch, just like 
you Todd Hames, you know, you know, literally. And, and that is actually what we are doing and have experience and how to translate that to where in the white supremacist chain we are, right? Because yeah. those are different spaces. There are different values put on them. And thank God it's equalizing re uh, in recent times, but like not fast enough, not soon enough and not enough enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. it is this, it is, that that kind of translation is having to happen. No, completely. And I also think we're in this beautiful time where you and I both have been like focusing on like, how do we reinvest into not just literally pyramid, but all of our institutions, right? Like the, that are like specifically were built for us, but at the same time, because we have been a part of and, and integral members of these predominantly white institutions, like how do we hold them accountable? Because like we have every right to be like, no, we need you to do better because this is just as yeah. much our space as it is the other. And we can also invest in our own spaces at the same time. Those two things aren't mutually exclusive. And I, and I, and I'm in mm -hmm. the period of like embracing the, cause some folks are like, man, fuck, we just need to be over here and only over here. And I, to be clear, I'm fine with that personally, but like, for whatever reason it is, we have found ourselves into these other spaces too. And it's like, no, like we know these people, we have relationships with them and we know that they know they need to do better. And now we're all at a point where we're like fed up with it. And it's like, do better. It's it's an opportunity to like build on the double consciousness. Sorry, go for it. Hey, Jasmine. No, no, you're good. Um, Manzara, finish your, finish your thought. Yeah, finish your thought. I don't wanna hear what you're gonna say. That's W.E.B. Du Bois, like double consciousness, yeah, though. Right. Like, and, and I think that, like, for me, it's a, a part of the frustration, particularly of the artistic leadership of these places that have been here for decades is we've been having this conversation for decades. Right. And so the, to the double consciousness, the either or it's like, no, that like that is an assessment of the status quo. And what we're called upon right now, I think, and what's really amazing about the We See You document and a lot of things is like, what can we do now, right? And yeah. part of that is the both, right? It's like, I'm yeah. going to make a lateral move from where I am in my community, a lateral move to yeah. where I am, which means I'm gonna speak like someone who has not just been invited to this table. I'm gonna speak like someone who is a leader at this table because I am a leader at this table because you don't know any black publications. <laughs> Because, yeah. because you don't know any black actors. Because yeah. you don't have any black dollars, right? Like these it's, things, you know, like and really- actually like bullshit too, because you did, you named it earlier. It's like, we've been saying the same thing for decades, but a lot of these leaders have not changed over the decades. So right. the fact that they seem to not be able to figure it out, uh, it says to me that it is a conscious choice to not figure it out. And thus it makes one then have to say, we need to an examination of what uh, giving up your power looks like. Because what we're really talking about in terms of structures and systems is that people are going to have to be willing to give something up if we actually want to change it for the future. And specifically, I'm saying white people are going to have to be willing to give something up and make space and room if they really want a more equitable theater. And also know that, like we're saying, we have our own spaces too. So we're going to keep our foot on your neck over here and also keep building on our own as well. Sorry. Y'all no, y'all have just been dropping these gems of wisdom and y'all are making my job hard because my first question, y'all just went ahead and answered it. Uh, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Uh, so Chris uh is interested in hearing, you know, how the founding of your own company, your own black theater company has influenced your processes and your uh and your perspectives being inside of these other institutions. Y'all kind of just hit on it when I popped in, but I'm not sure if there's anything else that that you feel you need to say on that? I have a succinct anecdote, but do you have something else, Bonsa, first? I'll go second. You sure? Mm -hmm. I Here's what I can say succinctly. When I'm working with Pyramid or for Pyramid, I'm just gonna bring it down to this. We don't ever have to have long conversations about the wigs and what we need to do <laughs> to like take care of these black women and their hair and these actors, right? Like it's like, that is a part of the culture because there's all black people that are that are a part of the founding of it. On the flip side of that, when I'm within these white institutions and whether that be my current institution or my previous place of employment, I am oftentimes the only black person in the uh, administrative and staff conversations. And yet, even if we're doing a show with an all black cast, all black creative team or whatever else it might be, when all of those people leave the room and then we have the internal institutional conversations and staff conversations, I then have to be the arbiter, right? Of like, 
all right, no, they're not being ridiculous. You can't do a period piece <laughs> and not figure out <laughs> these things. And that's not shade to either of my current places, but I'm just saying these are these are instances and things that I have experienced and seen where you have to explain these kinds of things because and, and, and then it's like, and what if I'm not there? Right? Like I happen to been- Right. That's I was just about to say if they ask, right? <laughs> if they ask. For for me, I'm like it's so interesting because like speak that's like a real producer standpoint. And then as like a, often a guest artist, the writer who comes in, I have learned to bring my community with me. And so there is no such thing as a closed meeting with me or closed reading. I am always going to invite oftentimes Shalia, but mostly like somebody to be in that room when that play is being read to the old white person who is like hoping that this hits the thing that they're looking for because they don't know the jokes, because they don't know the this, they don't know the that. I bring my own dramaturg. I bring my own, I bring my own everything to every time that it is not a intentionally black space because you just gotta insulate yourself. You gotta protect yourself. You have to build yourself up with people who can actually support you. Um, just because, you know, oftentimes for me, it's been like, here's the opportunity, but not necessarily here's the support. Mm -hmm. Speaking of support, there have been so many people in the comments who are just lovers of, of Pyramid. Tiff I know you, you've talked about Tiffany Johnson a bit. She's been in the comments out here. Um, hey, and so <laughs> and so Diane wants to know, how is Pyramid doing right now uh, in the midst of this pandemic? Are they producing virtual theater? Like what's coming up for, for Pyramid? Sure. Uh, Pyramid made a decision this summer uh, to make its first short film. And so uh, in the interest of full disclosure, because we're here talking about it, Jasmine uh, happens to be a associate producer on that film. And Monica was, was a part of the early script conversations and development as well. Uh, so Pyramid made a short film. Shout out to the amazing Jonathan Norton, this brilliant, brilliant writer who's currently the playwright in residence at uh, Dallas Theater Center, wrote this really beautiful film called The Last Supper about this young black queer uh, young man who ends up having to go home because of the pandemic from college and has to deal with, uh, uh, you know, many a thing, uh, being back at home with his mother. And it's a really beautiful, crazy, irreverent uh, piece. But uh, so we shot that film this summer and uh, it was great because they're two great New York actors who were able to participate in it because as writ, um, it's, some of it is via Zoom and some of it's via TikTok. So shout out to the amazing Portia, who I know has probably worked at MTC and everywhere. She's an amazing, you know, stalwart of like the off-Broadway and now Broadway scene. Um, who stars in the film along with this uh, this great young actor named Ricky uh, Woodruff. But we shot that film this summer and I am currently procrastinating on finishing editing it because I directed it. But the so. first five minutes are stunning. The yes. first couple of minutes are really good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sam Patala, this amazing young, um, you know, uh, uh, filmmaker, amazing young filmmaker of color who uh, is a cinematographer who mainly normally works for like National Geographic and shooting political ads. This is his first like narrative piece um, and we collaborated and shot it in person for three days in Iowa very safely uh, under guidelines and whatnot. And so, yeah, so that's what Pyramid is up to right now. I'm, I'm just being selfish and I'm saying I'm really excited to see it. <laughs> Same. Um, Same. And yeah, uh, another question that came up, uh, Jody, you wants to know, what is the next collaboration that we can expect from, from the two of you? Are you all cooking anything up? Where can we get more of this? <laughs> that's a Monsa, I, can, I don't know what I'm allowed to say, but Monsa, that's the, we're talking. I can say that and I'll let Monsa say more. But. We're talking, we are talking. Yeah, yes, is the answer. So I, I am, um, I, so I recently changed my name to Monsa Ra from Jure Brian Holder. I'm in the middle of a big personal metamorphosis um, and that, involves a slow moving away from a lot of the climbing that I had been doing, which is, you know, really want my show on Broadway or really want my piece to be published and all those things. And what I have gotten a couple of opportunities to do in my career is to devise pieces, just pick a couple of designers, some actors I really ex re admire and get in a room and, um, and make something from scratch. Um, and I went to Pyramid and humbly asked if they were interested in incubating a piece with me. Um, and so I'm in the process of reaching out to some actors and next summer we're gonna go to Iowa and maybe I'll sleep on another couch and we're just gonna do some guerrilla style theater making and devising and I'm really excited about it. Like, like it's my next project is gonna be with Pyramid and I can't wait. 
I love that. That it feels like very, very full circle, which is really wonderful. Um, the the last question came in from Alex, and he's wondering, you know, right now when there's a lot going on in the world, to say the least, like what is keeping you excited and hopeful uh, to keep creating art right now? I have an answer, Monsa. Do you want to go first, Love? I don't want to give you that. No, I don't have an answer yet, so I'll I'll let you go first. What is making me the most excited is that for once, it finally feels like there's a seismic shift uh, in the way that we are talking about and thinking about theater uh, and, and who gets to make it and who gets to hold what space on which platform and where. Like the fact that you and I are even here right now <laughs> talking on OTCs, yeah. like, like, you know, there's, there's clearly a shift. Now, yeah. that being said, what actually is making me hopeful and excited is not this, because to be clear, this is still a performative gesture, right? Like to just like call it for what it is. This is still like a performative gesture uh, around like the fact that we can't make things in person, we need content. And also it's really cool to have like black and brown people as a part of that content. But what makes me excited is that for a long time, people have this trope, this thing that they say, it's like, you know, they'll look at you when you're in grad school and if you're like a young black or brown leader and they'll say, you're the future of the, the blah, blah, blah. The future is now. That's what makes me the most excited and keeps me hopeful because many of these theaters and people are afraid to say, and I don't care, they're not gonna make it. Like some of them were already hanging on by a thread. They're not unfortunately probably to survive some of this, the, what is the larger economic impact. And the ones that do are going to be forced to have to think very differently about who they are providing space to, who and what their staffs and their leadership looks like. And I think as that shift becomes more real when we're actually able to gather again, whenever in the world that might be, it is going to lend itself naturally to a, a more inclusive and equitable theater. And will it be perfect? No. Will it still be rife with like white supremacist bullshit and racism? Probably. And yet, if there is a way to continue peeling it back, um, then I am hopeful and excited to see what that peeling back will look like. I'm also hopeful and excited because finally I'm starting to see some white leaders in particular who have held their seats for far too long starting to step away and, and step back and or at least announce plans for doing so um, so that people can start seeing that like there needs to be transitions in leadership in particular to make these spaces more equitable. And I'm hopeful and excited that that is what's going to come from this period. That's my answer. I should have gone first, huh? <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> uh, I echo that and say just a reminder to anybody watching that the we see you list are demands and not request. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that that sometimes get lost when, when we're having conversations. Um, and because those are demands and because those demands are from institutions that I work at that haven't quite replied yet uh, publicly or their leadership who you know needs to step down has not done so yet. My relationships with any places that are producing my work is just tenuous. It's just not a guarantee. Um, and so I am not excited about making any art. I'm not making any art. Um, I've just kind of like turned myself into the art project. It's like all that creative energy is um, being poured into myself to find out, or not to find out, to be the type of artist that I want to be because those weren't demands. I mean, those weren't requests, they were demands. Um, and none of us are outside of the scope of that. And I had to look inside myself as well. So I'm still kind of doing the work. I'm not at the doing the art part yet, um, which is fine because Fauci says we got time. <laughs> I'm being here at the house, hanging out with my friends. He does. Fauci says we have we have time, and with that, we we right here are out of time. But I think that's the perfect place to end. Kim, Matt, Manzara, thank you so so much for for being here, for sharing these gems of wisdom, for sharing your journeys with us. We really really appreciate it. Um, for anyone who's watching, we will be announcing more artists and conversations soon. So if you'd like to stay up to date with who we'll be chatting with next time, you can sign up for our email list. Uh, that's at manhattantheaterclub.com. And we will see you soon. Thank you so much, everyone. See you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>